Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to give the General Josiah Bunting Annual Veterans Day Lecture. I was contacted about this event by a friend of mine, someone who I have great respect for. He's a deep thinker with rock solid character. We work together at the Pentagon and have had the chance to discuss many ideas about the state of our world, leadership, and the need for thoughtful, morally courageous people to work on behalf of our country. Given how I've described him, it should come as no surprise he's a Hamilton College alumnus, a member of the Alexander Hamilton Institute, and gave the Veterans Day lecture at this great event in 2014. His name is Eric Hannes. I'm grateful to be his friend and that he contacted me about this opportunity. In preparing my talk, I read about General Bunting and his incredible life. It's an amazing thing to realize someone could accomplish so much in one lifetime. Not too many people are Rhodes Scholars, earn the Combat Infantry Badge and a Ranger Tab, authored several books, and served as a college president. General Bunting is an example of a commitment to lifelong growth. The General's work and service are as relevant today as they have ever been. I'll do my best to honor him tonight. I also salute the Alexander Hamilton Institute, Wooded Advocates, and the practical things it does to help foster academic achievement and discussion, and the things it does to grow and protect the future of our republic. Finally, Dr. Paquette, thank you for this opportunity. More importantly, thank you for your longstanding and continued commitment to the Alexander Hamilton Institute and for being a champion for personal freedom by making people aware of its requirement and its importance in our world. As you have forcefully stated, our republic requires an educated and vigilant populace to defend it because our way of life and form of government will not last without effort. Perhaps one of our founders put it best when asked after the Constitutional Convention what kind of government we had, Benjamin Franklin said, a republic if you can keep it. In preparation for this talk, I also researched the previous lecturer's background and listened to every AHI Veterans Day lecture I could. The oldest record I found dated back to 2013. After 10 great years, AHI looked to continue its success in bringing in an accomplished, mature, and intelligent speaker. Well, a decade was a good run. And it's obvious that Alexander Hamilton Institute resorted to scraping the bottom of the barrel this year, so here I am. That said, my name is Adam Hepp. I served 12 years on active duty in the Air Force and as a pilot as a pilot and air liaison officer. I flew F-16s out of Balad Air Base in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2007 and 2008. I was in Afghanistan during Operation Enduring Freedom in 2009 and 2010, where I worked on the ground alongside tactical air control parties to coordinate with air crews on close air support missions. My team and I were assigned with the U.S. Army Airborne Brigade Combat Team at Forward Operating Base Salerno. I separated from active duty in April 2012, but continued to serve in the Air Force Reserve, and in the past 11 years, I've worked in a variety of staff roles. For my full-time civilian job, I'm in a world far from military operations. After my active duty time, I wanted to grow myself academically and deepen my understanding of how our government works. So I went to law school. Currently, I'm a deputy district attorney, a prosecutor near Denver, Colorado. Before we get too far into this event, I wanna make you a couple promises about what the focus of this lecture is not. It is not a recounting of my career and meager accomplishments. First, that would be a brief and uninteresting speech Second, this is a talk about Veterans Day, and there are a lot more important and interesting things to say regarding that topic. Lastly, I will fully admit I did not have it as tough as many veterans. I did not deploy as much as some people. Other veterans have suffered more hardships, danger, and injuries far greater than I. I did my best with what I had, and I'm humbled to be here and share some time with you. I'm here to talk about my perspective, on Veterans Day. Besides, I only know my own experience and I do my best to understand that experience and what I've learned. Finally, my experiences are an incredibly small part of the total picture of Veterans Day. I'm grateful and proud to be part of its tradition 
and hope to render the proper honor and respect to the veterans that met all our veterans and the nation we serve. All right, I apologize. I'm not with you in person tonight, but without this type of forum and technology, I probably wouldn't have been able to give this talk at all. So I'm grateful for it. Also, I wasn't given any guidance or boundaries about the topics of this speech. That is a great opportunity, but it's also a great responsibility. Please remember throughout my speech that any errors in judgment, vocabulary, and any missteps are mine alone. I'll own my mistakes, provide no excuses. Lastly, when asking a lawyer and fighter pilot to talk about their experiences, you're usually in for a few hours of non-stop blabbering. But Dr. Paquette demonstrated his wisdom and limited me to 40 minutes. In all seriousness, I'm grateful for this opportunity. But like a lot of veterans, I'm reticent to speak about my experiences overseas. Part of being a veteran, and especially on Veterans Day, though, is to share our stories when we can. The stories help connect us to other veterans, provide some perspective to people without our experiences, and remind us of the accountability attached to all of our actions while in uniform. I'll do my best to add to those areas tonight. Now, before I begin the meat of the speech, a prosecutor should never say I during opening or closing arguments. You do that to focus the jury's attention on what's important, the evidence, the facts that prove what happened and away from you. That's your duty. Similarly, as veterans know, military service is about duty. It's not about you. Veterans serve something greater than themselves. Veterans serve to protect and defend the person on their left and on their right, our neighbors, our laws, and ultimately, this great experiment we call the United States of America. Tonight, though, I am forced to occasionally say I first because I'm going to talk about my experiences, and second, speaking about yourself in the third person is a little weird. Now, there's an old and all too common saying in the military, never volunteer for anything. There are many logical, time-tested reasons behind that saying, because when you volunteer, you're probably signing up for more work, a greater time commitment, and you never quite know what you're getting yourself into. The expression, never volunteer for anything, has been heard by countless veterans, but it is a bit ironic given today's military is an all-volunteer force and has been since January 1973. Even when there was, a dra there was a draft, a significant number of people in the military volunteered to join. And when volunteering during wartime, they volunteered for the fight. In World War II, about 40% of those who served volunteered to do so. In Vietnam, it was even higher. About two thirds of military members were volunteers. Today, our military needs volunteers to sustain our force and our country needs volunteers to serve in other countless ways. We also need leaders at every level, from our local community to the military to positions with national influence. I titled this lecture, Never Volunteer for Anything, Volunteers, Leaders, and the Value of Trust, because I wanna talk about those, three, those last three things and their application to Veterans Day in my experience in the Air Force. The title was spurred by a few events that have impacted and changed in, in a good way, my career and life. All of that was launched by a meeting back in 2006. A week before I graduated from, S from F-16 training at Luke Air Force Base in Arizona, my class of six pilots and I had a closed door meeting with the Colonel who was in charge of the base, who was the wing commander. It was a meeting with the world's newest F-16 pilots and the most senior F-16 pilot on base. He was also one of the most experienced F-16 pilots in the entire Air Force. Meetings like this one are called a hot wash, and their purpose is to get unfiltered information and feedback directly to the commander. My classmates and I were a little hesitant to throw around our opinions at first, but the boss put us at ease by explaining some things he already suspected about areas that we we're going to talk about what instructors were good, who wasn't, and parts of the training syllabus that could be improved. And he was 100% correct and incredibly candid. That quickly gained our trust. 
After we shared our thoughts, the wing commander also offered us some advice about being fighter pilots. One thing he said stood out. He said the Air Force will always be short of volunteers and leaders. He explained that our duty called on us to be both volunteers to take on the toughest tasks, to deploy and fight in our nation's wars, who were going on at that time, and to be leaders in word and deed. And as leaders, the need to set an example, not only in our fighter pilot community, but for the entire Air Force. His words always stuck with me. I knew the wing commander well from a previous Air Force experience, and I knew I could trust him and his character. That talk about volunteers and leaders and the value of trust is never far from my mind as I continued back then to serve on active duty, after I separated and took out a civilian career, and in my continued participation in the Air Force Reserve. The talk and the commander's example and the years ahead also make me think about today's leaders and the need for them to remember their duty and to be worthy of our trust. Alexander Hamilton's accomplishments and status as a veteran also helped set the tone for my three main topics, volunteers, leaders, and the value of trust. First, being a volunteer and a leader both require courage. The most difficult circumstances require the most difficult kind of courage, moral courage, an essential quality in any leader. Alexander Hamilton displayed moral courage throughout his life by rising up from his own circumstances to entering into the military during the Revolutionary War and during his later work in politics and as a financial genius at our country's founding. Hamilton's actions and character gained the trust of George Washington. I cannot think of a higher endorsement than that. Now, after I graduated from that initial F-16 training, I was assigned to Hill Air Force Base in Utah, arriving in August 2006. It was an incredible location. It had four F-16 squadrons, three active duty and one reserve, plus enough mountains, hiking trails, and rivers filled with trout to give you plenty to do on days off. I was assigned to an active duty squadron and began training to achieve combat mission ready status. Now, what does that training look like? It was another syllabus of required flights and events. You'd fly in two and four ship formations and be graded on everything from instrument flying to air to air missions to air to ground missions. Finally, towards the end, you'd move on to more complex missions involving fighting through air to air engagements and then to drop bombs on a target after those engagements. And then as well, training on close air support missions where you're co coordinating with ground forces. You'll learn how to use your jet as a weapon system, especially when using radar and a targeting pod. Now a targeting pod, as the name would suggest, is similar to a high powered camera that's attached to your jet. You use it to find targets on the ground and zoom in on them from miles away. It can also guide weapons using a laser and can be used in both camera mode or infrared modes, whatever best for that situation. I completed my training in a couple months without, well, let's say, too much trouble. I like any large organization, the Air Force and individual flying squadrons have a lot of moving parts, a lot of things to get done, and limited resources to accomplish the mission. In November 2006, I was a wingman in the 34th Fighter Squadron. I had just finished a scheduling meeting with the Director of Operations. That's the person second in command of the squadron. When the commander walked through the door, he told us an F-16 had just crashed during combat operations in Western Iraq and a safety investigation board was needed in country as soon as possible. As a side note, when there's a death from an airplane crash or an aircraft accident that causes millions of dollars of damage, the Air Force convenes a safety investigation board as soon as possible to determine what happened. Whether the accident was caused by a mechanical or maintenance issue that could, that could cause more crashes, or whether it was a training issue that needs to be corrected to make our pilots more effective and less vulnerable to the same situation. Our squadron was tasked with finding a volunteer to be part of the investigation. Now, back in 2005, I had been on another safety investigation board and with that experience, I immediately told my boss I'd volunteer. The crashed aircraft was out of Balad Air Base in Iraq, and that's where we'd start our investigation. 
Volunteering would mean leaving on short notice to Iraq and spending the next 30 days or so without a day off, trying to determine why the aircraft crashed. I was in and ready to help. Now the same wing commander that talked to my classmates and me about volunteers and leaders was now a Brigadier General and the commander at Balad Air Base. He was a busy guy and I had no plans to bother him. While we were at Balad though, he contacted me and told me to stop by. And when a general tells you to do something, you do it. We talked about what was going on in Iraq at that time, some of the enemy's tactics, and how F-16 pilots were helping in the fight. Then he asked me a question. When are you coming over here to fly? I told him I didn't know. I told him my squadron that I was assigned to was currently assigned to Operation Noble Eagle. That was the post 9-11 mission that required fighters to fly combat air patrols over U.S. cities when the president or another high-ranking government official was in town. The general looked me in the eye and said, then it's time to find yourself a new squadron. I asked if that was even possible, as usually you have very little input or choice in your military assignment. He looked at me again and said, where there's a will, there's a way. I left his office wondering how I could do something I hadn't even heard of, changing fighter squadrons and deploying overseas without any idea of how to make it happen. Well, we completed the investigation in late January 2007 and briefed our findings. A few weeks later, after I returned home, I learned another squadron at Hill Air Force Base, the fourth fighter squadron, would be deployed to Iraq in August 2007 for five and a half months instead of the traditional four-month fighter squadron deployment. Additionally, word went out that they were looking for three volunteers to join them. I saw my opportunity, all based on the words of a leader I knew I could trust. I volunteered and was selected and changed squadrons. We immediately began training for Operation Iraqi Freedom, known as OIF. Now the flying mission in OIF would be close air support, often spoke of in its acronym, CAS, directly supporting uh, the mission of the people on the ground. That was the most important mission in the theater, and now those were the most important people in the theater, the troops on the ground, and especially those in contact with the enemy. And the enemy were terrorists or insurgents, hoping to sow chaos, lawlessness, and murder across Iraq, and do as much damage as possible to U.S. and coalition forces. Now, what is close air support? Traditionally, it's using an aircraft's weapons against hostile ground targets that are in close proximity to friendly forces. Because the weapons are being delivered so close to friendly forces, it requires close and careful integration and communication with our troops on the ground. In the vast majority of missions, two airplanes would arrive over the target and begin circling it. We call it a wheel. And why in that wheel over the target we talk to the troops on the ground, receive information about what they needed, and then provide, coordinate to provide the support that they requested. In the fighter world, you always fly in teams of two. That's done for mutual support, to work as a team, to coordinate attacks, and back each other up with checklists, visual lookout, and anything else that might come up. We trained for day and night missions, using targeting pods to find targets and track moving vehicles. We practiced delivering every type of weapon we would carry in Iraq, working to perfect our procedures and accuracy. We also trained to perfect our teamwork between the pilots and the guys on the ground. And after months of training, we deployed to Iraq in August 2007. Now, CAS is a unique mission because it requires communication, teamwork, and trust beyond the people who are flying the airplanes. To be successful, you have to leave Eagle and rank behind. In CAS, you're coordinating with a German joint terminal attack controller called JTACs, who provide coordination and final clearance for the attack. You're working with ground force commanders and other air assets from airplanes to drone pilots. Now in CAS, and especially in combat, no one is more important than anyone else in getting the job done. The JTAC could be a lower ranking enlisted member. The ground commander could be a lieutenant or a lieutenant colonel. It didn't matter. Now, why was CAS important in Operation Iraqi Freedom? 
Well, for F-16s, it was the only mission because as you would expect, the mission in Iraq was supporting the ground forces. The role of CAS expanded beyond delivering just weapons though. We provided armed overwatch. We used our targeting pods to search for IEDs along roadways. We provided air cover for special operations raids. And we were, uh, also responded to calls for immediate help when people were under fire, known as troops in contact, or its initials, a tick. That's when our forces were engaged with the enemy and needed immediate help. While most missions did not involve employing a weapon, troops in contact situations were much more likely to request and require an air to ground attack. And those circumstances most definitely happened when we were there. Flying CAS and Operation Rocket Freedom was not something out of Top Gun. It was not a high speed air to air engagement between fighter aircraft. It was two aircraft circling a target area, spending four to six hours per flight searching for IEDs or people or vehicles, talking to people at the boots in the ground and monitoring your jet in your assigned airspace and keeping track of time to meet up with the tanker for air to air refueling. Those hours were sometimes pierced by moments when our support was needed by people under fire. In the critical moments when you were working on getting the mission done, especially those times when friendly forces were under fire, what made the difference was clear communication, complying with the rules of engagement, professional competence, and trust. Now, how did it all come together? Let's talk about that with one example. In 2007, my flight lead and I were flying over central Iraq in a daytime cast mission. We received a call for help from the, from the Army unit stationed in Samara. That city is about 80 miles north of Baghdad. If you'll remember, Samara is the site of the Golden Mosque, one of the holiest cities in Shia Islam. It was bombed twice by Al-Qaeda, first in February 2006 and again in June 2007. And they did that in hopes of fermenting further civil war and sectarian violence. In 2007, Samara continued to be a hotbed of terrorist activity. Now the army commander was very smart. We had heard rumors that he got the lesson from Alexander the Great, but I'll give the army commander credit. He went old school in his efforts to secure the city. He used heavy equipment to move desert sand from the surrounding area and erected a high berm that encircled the city and prevented people or vehicles from enter or leaving except at two controlled entry points that were manned by U.S. and Iraqi forces. After those ingenious efforts, violent decre violence decreased. When we were called in, terrorists were using a large front end loader to dig through the berm and allow about a dozen vehicles filled with terrorists and weapons into the city. Terrorists had used the same method just a month earlier and had gotten away with it. By the time we arrived overhead, the vehicles had gotten into the city. The cars dispersed, but the front end loader was being tracked by a drone. We arrived overhead, checked in with the JTAC, and received the most updated coordinates for the front end loader. Now that all sounds very efficient, and the first part was. We are in good communication with the ground forces. We're given coordinates that would direct our targeting pods, and the Army drone was still watching the front end loader. Now I should mention something about targeting pods. The image from the targeting pod is displayed in a four by four inch screen in the cockpit. It's black and white, and it's right above one of your knees. Also, you can zoom in with the targeting pod, but looking through it is referred to as looking through a soda straw. So I can look outside the canopy and look down at the ground and have an expansive view, but from 12,000 feet up, it's impossible to track a vehicle in a crowded city with just your eyes. When you're looking for something, especially a moving target, you start with the known coordinates, but you have to search with the pod. That requires discipline, especially when the target is driving through city streets. You control the targeting pod with a small disc that's on the throttle and under your thumb. As you move the sensor around, you can't do so wildly. There's too many things to see and too much to process. But back to Samara. I was lucky. I found the target rather quickly. Now, I didn't think there were a lot of front end loaders driving around Samara that day, but I had to confirm the target with the ground forces that had been watching it with the drone. In flying, you usually use three pieces of evidence to confirm something. 
whether it's a point in the ground or a target. One or two things might be a coincidence and lead you astray. Three things makes it as certain as you can. I do want to add, war is never perfect, but great care was taken in every attack and target confirmation in Iraq. Both the ground forces and pilots took it very seriously to always confirm the target, even in dangerous and life-threatening situations where U.S. and partner nations were under fire. It was a moral imperative that demonstrates the high value placed upon the trust that we had to maintain with the Iraqi people. Because when you push the pickle button to release a bomb or a missile or pull the trigger to fire the aircraft's gun, that decision is with you for the rest of your life. You do your best to ensure the decision is the right one and that innocent lives and friendly forces are safe and protected and that the lives of evildoers are not. After confirming we had the right front end loader, my flight lead and I used our onboard systems to get his targeting pod on the target as well. Once he acquired it, ground forces again confirmed it was the proper front end loader and it provided information for the attack and told me, all in with direction and expect clearance on final. The flight lead and I accomplished our internal checks and dove down towards the target. I would fire an air to ground missile and he would use his targeting pod's laser to guide it to the target. Teamwork and trust were essential. I asked the JTAC for clearance and it was given to me. The missile fired from under my right wing, cracking the target that was about one mile away, a distance that was covered in only a few seconds. The attack was successful and the front end loader destroyed. This was the first time a laser Maverick missile was used against a moving target in combat. The after action report revealed the front end loader and the people operating it were known terrorists who had been a big part of the problem in Samara. Now why that story? What's the so what? The small contribution to our efforts in Iraq represented a lot of things. The power of communication, technical competency, great training, and teamwork. The mission's success was accomplished by a group of volunteers who worked together and trusted each other to get the job done. Because of the example I shared with you and other things I was involved in during that deployment, and more so because of the success we had as a squadron, I was awarded Wingman of the Year for Hill Air Force Base. Now, I'm not revealing that to say anything great about me. It says much more about the great people we had in my squadron. And most importantly, it only happened. And I was only there because a leader who I trusted inspired me to be a volunteer. Now, I won't bore you with my other military assignments, but to say volunteering and leading are constants. From working with the Royal Jordanian Air Force, to my time in Afghanistan, to running an Inspector General investigation, and other examples that have all been my great privilege during my time in the Air Force. And here's a key point on Veterans Day. I am not alone, nor am I special in this conduct. Our veterans have done this kind of work with great character and honor throughout history, volunteering and leading to serve our nation. Now, I've talked a lot about leaders, volunteers, and the value of trust. Things that I experienced in the military and how it contributed to my life. This lecture would be incomplete, however, if I didn't briefly address how those qualities apply to our political leadership at state, local, and most importantly, from a military and national security perspective at the national level. First, a good example, Alexander Hamilton. He was a rare combination, a warrior and a politician. He had tremendous success in both military and politics because of his value and his vision. How he combined idealism and practical applications to fuel achievement is incredible. Now, while the arenas, tactics, and grand strategy might change, his passion for leadership did not. The transition between military and elected political leadership is difficult, but it is possible. And that's, that is evidenced by a few presidents from our last century and the veterans 
now serving honorably in Congress. Representatives Dan Crenshaw from Texas and Jason Crow from Colorado, as well as Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas are three examples. Now, how do volunteers, leaders, and trust apply to politics? Before you laugh or roll your eyes, please stay with me for just a few more minutes. First, the last time I checked, no one was conscripted or drafted into Congress or the White House. The opposite is true. People fight tooth and nail to gain political office. So to be clear, every one of our elected leaders in Washington, D.C. is a volunteer, a volunteer who works for us. We need them to be leaders, not people who obey, obey the latest polling numbers or only seek to be popular, troll others, or get noticed on social media. We need them to be leaders that hold to the courage of their convictions and do what they believe is right for the country. We need them to be above reproach and avoid even the perception of malfeasance. We need them to be responsible and work towards solutions as honest brokers and in good faith. Because remember, as strong, as capable, and as honorable as our military is, the use of our military is merely an extension of our political will. Our leaders need to examine, debate, and honestly explain the why behind where they get the military involved and only do so when absolutely necessary. By having the essential quality we discussed earlier, moral courage, and how they live their lives and how they approach the accountability they owe us, our political leaders can establish and maintain the trust needed to lead. Our annual deficit and national debt are undeniable national security threats, perhaps the greatest we face. But ever since Lyndon Johnson was president, there has been a trust deficit with our political leadership. The American people have not held great faith nor trust in our elected leaders for over 50 years. We're too great of a country, too good of a people, and too important in our world community for that to be the status quo. We need to trust in our leadership, but first we need to elect leaders worthy of that trust. Take great care in casting your vote. Now, the Alexander Hamilton Institute honors Alexander Hamilton's work and memory. Veterans Day honors the past and respects those who have sacrificed, from Alexander Hamilton to the veterans of today. Although limited in scope, experience, and eloquence, this talk was one perspective on Veterans Day and how three essential qualities contributed to my career and life. If I could take sole credit for all I've learned and done, I would, but I cannot. I've worked with amazing people, learned from a few great leaders, and if I can be candid with you, many of my successes are attributable to being in the right place at the right time, rather than some abundance of talent, skill, or intelligence. Without being a volunteer though, none of it was possible. Veterans Day remains an important and revered holiday as it should. It's an annual reminder to look back, reflect, and say thank you to those who have served no matter their job in the military, where they served, or for how long. It's a chance to remember and honor them and make sure we never forget their sacrifice. It's also an opportunity for perspective and appreciation. Perspective on the uniqueness of every veteran's experience and the collective togetherness, that connection shared between all veterans. It's also a day to appreciate the contributions, effort, service, and sacrifice veterans have made. To those who are listening, to non-veterans, I encourage you to talk with veterans, listen to their stories. Veterans, share your stories when you can, please. The stories and the people who tell them are living history, and, in, and the individual stories you'll be privileged to hear are part of our country's fabric. The stories are important, the stories will remind you of what it takes to preserve our way of life and the freedom we enjoy. Maybe they'll be entertaining. Maybe they'll give you a different perspective. Maybe they'll inspire you to become a volunteer and later a leader in your own way. The military has an essential role in serving our country to maintain our way of life and make sure the United States remains a beacon of light, hope, 
freedom, and opportunity to the world. As we honor Veterans Day, we must also nurture the spirit that will motivate future generations to answer the call to service and become our next generation of veterans. Young men and women willing to volunteer, be leaders, and embrace our sacred trust. I'm grateful for the opportunity to give this annual lecture, the General Josiah Bunting Veterans Day Lecture, and share part of my experience. I'm also eternally grateful to have had the honor of serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. The service has made me grow as a person. It has broadened my perspective and given me a deeper, more meaningful life. The man who commissioned me into the Air Force, Colonel William S. Cole Jr., kept a quote on his desk, and I'll leave you with it. It's a privilege to be born free. It's a right to live free. It's a responsibility to die free. I thank all the veterans that have borne that responsibility. Veterans who have helped keep our republic. I thank Dr. Paquette and the Alexander Hamilton Institute for allowing me to speak to you. And I thank all of you for sharing your time with me tonight.